We routinely emphasize the importance of Bible study. We try to emphasize that there is something called rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Obviously, if you just pick it up and read it any way anybody was moved to read it, there wouldn't be any need to say rightly dividing the word of truth. The very fact that the Holy Spirit through the pen of Paul would say you must write and divide it or handle it right indicates you can't handle it wrongly. So you can read your Bible every day. That doesn't mean you're handling it correct. Anyone's to be highly commended who approaches the Bible as the Word of God and studies it with the desire to learn God's will. But there are certain things that are necessary to understand about what it is to handle right or right to divide the Word of Truth. We all know that Israel of old, the prophet of them, one of the prophets, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We don't want to be found in that position because those things concerning Israel were written before time for our learning. We, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope, Romans 15, 4. And if they could be destroyed for lack of knowledge, so can we, individually or as a group, as we, in our ignorance of God's Word and in our ignorance of how to write and divide it, simply don't know it. Paul, in writing to Timothy in chapter 3 and verse 7, spoke about some people who were ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I think we live in an age like that today. There's some very intellectual people, very high IQs, very studious, and they know a whole lot about a lot of things, but they couldn't tell you about the plan of salvation if their soul depends on it, and it does. So we need to understand that we don't want to fall into that category of learning and learning and learning, but because we don't handle aright the word of truth, we never really understand what God requires of a person become a Christian, and live a faithful Christian life. So today I'm going to be studying in the general area of rightly dividing or handling right the word of truth. And we're going to emphasize how that we are to do only what is written. And we're not to go beyond the things that are written. Communication between two people takes place when at least one of them understands the meaning of the words the other is saying to him. And if there's communication and back and forth, it must be the same way. God has spoken, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, in his word to communicate to us how to be saved and how to live the Christian life that we'll have eternal salvation in heaven. But if we do not know how to handle the truth, if we don't know that His will is communicated in His words, not outside of His words, but only in His words, then we'll be as lost as anyone else who is separated from God. So there are those who like to say the Bible contradicts itself because they'll find in this passage something said that when they see the same subject under discussion over here, they think they find something that different but that's not the case when you realize that all scriptures give of inspiration of God that is God wrote the Bible there are different writers of the Bible but God's the author of the Bible you say that again there are different writers of the Bible but God authored the Bible that's what's being said by Paul to Timothy as he himself was speaking as the Holy Spirit guided him to write those words concerning the importance of the scriptures 2 Timothy 3 16 to 17 and the passage we referred to already in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, where we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. So what do you do when witnesses to an event give two different sets of details? What do you do? Consider this. Matthew 28, 1 through 7. And I'll pause here and say you need to write these down 
because you'll see why as we go through. I won't have time to read all these scriptures. But you need to write them down so that you can go back later and compare and contrast those scriptures for the main point I'm going to make about this. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 7, mentions an angel rolling away the stone that was blocking the entrance to the tomb where Jesus was laid. It also tells us that he was sitting upon that stone. And then we also learn in that passage, Matthew 28, 1 through 7, that the angel talks to the women when they get to the tomb. Now, when you go to Mark's account, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 7, Mark 16, 1 through 7, Mark tells us that an angel inside the tomb who was standing on the right side talked to the women. If you read Luke's account, Luke chapter 20, Four, verses 1 through 8, Luke tells us of two angels that appeared while they were in the tomb. And while in the tomb, they were trying to determine what happened to the body of Jesus. And he tells us that those angels spoke to the women. Question. Do we have a contradiction or different details of the same event? We certainly don't have a contradiction. God wrote the Bible. It all harmonizes. But this begins to reveal to us what we started out on in the introduction of the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. We often say, do not start reasoning with the material till you have all the material. Then you can, if your reasoning is correct, arrive at the correct conclusion, thus the truth on the matter. The accounts that mention one angel do not state that there was only one angel present. Might be easy for us to read it in there, but it doesn't say it. Luke's account mentions two angels. But Luke does not say that both angels talked at the same time or even that both angels spoke. Only that the angels address the women. Knowing that God wrote the Bible, knowing the Bible because it's God's word does contradict itself, I would simply say the key to this is a difference in time. A difference in time. Matthew talks about the angel rolling away the stone, sitting on it, while the guards were still present, and before the women came. He mention, mentions the angel speaking to the women, but Matthew does not say where they were at that moment. Luke mentions that the tomb was empty when they first went in, and then the angels who talked with them appeared. Mark mentions that they went into the tomb and that the angel on the right spoke to them. Remember what we've emphasized countless times as a rule of Bible study and rightly dividing the word of truth that we can arrive at the truth on any subject. You must take all of the information in its proper context before you start reasoning with it. Here is the point about these matters and others like them of course all of these are compatible if we realize that there was a time order and some details were being skipped remember there's a reason God chose four men to write the full account of the life of Christ and they didn't always, as we labored on Wednesday night to point out and study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record all the same thing. 
And to get the full picture, we said it over and over and time and time again. Of a given topic, you must read all of what the Bible says on the matter. When people claim there's a contradiction, at least it's because they assume things when the author didn't mention something. In effect, we're talking about actually respecting the, the silence. God communicates through the meaning of words. If there's no word on it, since faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, you can't have any faith on it. Some assume that if one angel is mentioned, then there must be only one. Notice I say assume, not implied. Some assume that if a location is mentioned, then everything happened at that place. When there's no reason in the scriptures from what's actually recorded to conclude such a thing. Some assume that not mentioning a fact means the author didn't think that it happened. But what kind of a rule is that? There are a lot of things in teaching, well, even you as a teacher, teaching somebody something at a given point from a given book that you may not mention what some other book may mention about the matter. You're interested in what's being said right here. We do that, and we've tried to do that on these many Wednesday nights, studying Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, the question is, what can you assume when an author does not say something? Well, the only reasonable answer is that you can assume nothing, not one thing. You have no revelation to go on. You have no information to operate on. He didn't give you his word on it. How then do you know? Now, going back to the reformation of the 14, 15, 1600s, when the Bible was being put into the hands of men so all could read it in their own languages and the great rebellion against Roman Catholicism known as the Reformation and many times referred to as the Protestant Reformation because they were protesting. One of the things, and I think especially of Luther right here, where he failed in many ways, but he failed on this one when it comes to the study of the Bible, he took the position that if not explicitly said, then you could do what you want to. Well, may I remind you, there is no explicit prohibition for anybody saying, thou shalt not kiss the Pope's toe. Now, you go to your Bible and study it and see if you can find that prohibition. And yet, if you understand how the Word of God teaches and right dividing the Word of Truth, you'll know that the reason that Catholics kiss the Pope's toe is certainly not taught in the Bible. It's not authorized by Christ. It has nothing to do with Christianity. So again, we're talking about where there is no word, there can be no faith, because faith comes by hearing the word. And that ties in with 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we're to walk by faith and not by sight, which means since the faith in God that we have comes through the knowledge of the word we study, then if we walk by faith and not by sight, we're walking as the word of God leads us and guides us and directs us. So God expects us to respect his silence. Where there is no word, there is no faith. If he has not said something, I have no business trying to fill in the gap with my own think so. For there is a way that seemeth right unto a man but the end thereof are the ways of death. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse number 2 and chapter 12 verse 32 says don't add to the word of God. Don't take away from it. The writer of Proverbs adds something to that in Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6. He says if you add to the word of God, you're a liar. Now why is that? God, God didn't reveal it. That's coming from man. And we're all familiar with Paul's statement to the churches of Galatia 
in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Though we are an angel, preach any other gospel to you, that which you have preached, then let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. In the Greek, that means cut off. How does God feel about false teachers? They ought to be cut off from God. Serious business to teach contrary to God's will. So we see we're not to alter it in any form or fashion. We're not to pollute it by adding to it or taking from it or any way that you can. Another point to be made in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, as Paul was correcting the abuses of the members of the church, some of them at least, in Corinth, because of the way they were using the miraculous gifts, wasn't as God intended. He said God's not the author of confusion. Now think about that for a minute. God is not the author of confusion. So obviously what they were doing didn't have God in the doing of it. Because when you read the description there in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and especially 14, you'll see that they were, by their own will, using those gifts contrary to the way God intended to benefit the church. Now there can be no oneness and there can be no unity except that there be a standard of authority to which we all appeal. We all accept. It's the reason that we are pouring out to people when we're trying to study with them about becoming a Christian. What do you believe is the final authority in religion? A Roman Catholic does not believe that the Bible is a final authority in religion. Pentecostal people do not believe the Bible is the final authority. They go on what they call the Holy Spirit's direct leadings, which is nothing more than a lot of emotional stuff. Some of them have been known to say when pressed that I wouldn't exchange this feeling in my heart for a stack of Bibles. Then you can go on into people like the Mormons and the Seventh-day Adventists and Christian Science. And they all have and believe in revelations beyond the Bible. The devil's got to get you away from the pure, unadulterated Word of God. And he has many ways to do that. And what we're doing here now is just dealing with one of those ways that we won't get caught up in rightly dividing the Word of Truth in doing that. So God's not the author of confusion. Well, in that same chapter, he says, all things are done decently in order. Now, you try to do things decently in order without everybody appealing to the same standard of authority and see what happens. When you look around this nation over the past few months, in some of the cities, you see exactly what happens. And there's no use trying to sugarcoat it. Everybody's doing that which is right in their own eyes, and they do not respect the authority of the Constitution of the United States nor any other laws of those cities or anything else. And when the people in governmental positions don't respect it either and encourage them in violating the truth, they're really worse off than the people out there in the streets. Now you can say you're getting very political, but have you ever read Romans 13 where God settled it? And I assure you those people of the Roman Empire had no rights that the Constitution guarantees us. And yet we see the design and the purpose and the mind of Almighty God for civil government. So whether it's pertaining to your soul salvation, whether it's the operation of your home, whether it's uh, a school being conducted like it ought to be, there must be a final standard of authority to which all appeal. God's people are a people of divine law. James 1 verse 25, Whoso look in the perfect law of liberty and continue it therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man will be blessed in his deed. So confusion takes place when people will not abide by 
what's been revealed in the words of the Bible. Now, God cannot lie. Paul told the young preacher Titus that in Titus 1 verse 2. said elsewhere, but that's what I'm referring to. Aren't you glad there is a being that cannot tell a falsehood? It's against the very essence of his being and the nature that flows from that essence. He is truth. What did Jesus say in John 14 verse 6? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father but by me. Then in John 8, 31, 32, we're right back where we started. In the most common scripture to all of us. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. Indeed, that is in the things you do. And what's going to follow? Ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. God can't lie. He's revealed the way of salvation in words. And we dare not go beyond those words. And we're taught to rightly divide them or handle them correctly. So if two accounts in the scriptures have different details, we don't assume a contradiction. We look to see if there's a way that the accounts harmonize. You know, that's one of the ways God challenges us to say, how much you really want to study this book? Always through life, our faith in God and His Word is going to be tried. Abraham, pictured as the father of the faithful with the patriarchal age, mosaical age of the Christian dispensation, is the prime example of faithfulness because he did exactly what his God told him to do without addition, subtraction, or alteration. That's why he serves as an example to all of us. There are other examples. I hope you're seeing this has to do with the rules of biblical hermeneutics and the right division of the word. Let me look at the young ruler. Most of the time we'll say the rich young ruler. In Matthew 19, verse 20, Matthew 19, 20, Matthew mentions that this man is young. If you turn to Mark's account, chapter 10, verse 17, Mark tells us that he ran up to Jesus, but Mark does not say anything about the ruler, him being a ruler or being young. But go to Luke, in Luke chapter 18, verse 18, Luke 18, 18, he mentions that he's a ruler. What do we say about getting all of the facts together before we start reasoning with him to come to our conclusion about this man we call the rich young ruler? And we may ask here, are there conflicts or just different parts of the same event found in the three gospel accounts? Well, the second, of course, is true. But it takes careful study of the scriptures. It's not a slap my dab approach. It takes some time to sit down as you're reading where your mind can work properly. You are reading the word of God that will judge us all in the last day to make sure that we have gathered all of the relevant facts. But we've read of the blind men. Blind men. And you'll know what blind men is. We go through what the Bible says about these blind men. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34, Matthew tells us that there were two, two blind men. When you go over to Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52, he tells us there was a blind man named Bartimaeus. In Luke 18, 35 through 43, he just says there was a blind man. Question. Did the fact that both Mark and Luke mention one blind man and Matthew mentions two men 
mean that uh, Matthew got the story wrong? Or are the writers zeroing in just on certain matters? If I were to say to somebody tomorrow that at about this time today, I preached a sermon to Buddy, did I tell the truth? I certainly did. And somebody else about next Thursday says, yeah, David at about that time on Sunday preached a sermon and then called out several of your names. Two different people, each saying different things. Both of them told the truth. We need to understand the nature of what it is when it comes to witnesses. Notice that neither Mark nor Luke eliminate additional people in their accounts. They only focus on one particular person. So when I say I preach today this sermon to Buddy, I just singled him out. If you didn't listen to what I had to say, that doesn't mean you weren't preached to. <laughs> so we... <laughs> Well, honest confession is good for the soul. But anyway, I don't know of any of us. You know, this is one thing about a teacher. You don't know who may need what you're preaching more that day than some other time. You may know who you may want it to hit. We'll put it that way. All preachers do that. But it may hit the very one and do somebody else uh, more good than the one you had in mind. Because you don't know the hearts of men. Some people say, well, how many um, responses did you have to your sermon? Well, I didn't have any. Well, that's not true. When we offer the invitation today, I have as many responses to this sermon as there are people in here. But we tend to limit responses to did they, were they baptized into Christ or did they confess sins or whatever. Well, let's look at some demon-possessed men. In Matthew 8, in verse 28, two men are mentioned from the tombs. In Mark 5, beginning in verse 1 and verses following, Mark 5, 1 following, Mark only mentions one man from the tombs. In Luke 8, verse 26 and the verses following, Luke 8, 26 verses following, Luke mentions one homeless man from the city. Again, different details, but none are worded exclusively. So there are no conflict. Now, I'm just selecting some of these. This takes place as you go through your Bible, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, and trying to get just what is said. Now, what happens if two commands appear to conflict? You know, the Sabbath under the law of Moses, or rather the law of Moses concerning the Sabbath, didn't allow a person to work. Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 through 15. But the priests were required to offer sacrifices on the Sabbath. Numbers chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. Little boys were commanded to be circumcised on the eighth day. What if it falls on the Sabbath? Obviously, there's no contradiction. And we'll see more about that a little later. Matthew 12, 1 through 8. Matthew 12, 1 through 8, mentions that priests were not wrong in offering sacrifices. Mark 2, verses 23 through 28, and Luke 6, verses 1 through 5, do not mention the exception for priests. In John chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, it is mentioned that circumcision is allowed 
but not the mercy extended to David or the sacrifices done by priests. Now here's what needs to be understood about the prohibition concerning people were not to work. Because man gathered sticks on the Sabbath day and they put him to death. They stoned him. Now again, that prohibition is Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. That prohibition covered what you do for a living. It didn't mean that if you're sitting down, you couldn't fan a mosquito off your nose because that's work. The rabbis tried to sit down and figure all that out, so they came up with their traditions, and Jesus said your traditions have set aside the word of God. He also said when they sit in Moses' seat, do whatever they bid you do, but do not do as they do, for they say and do not. There's no disagreement here with what these people did when you had the prohibition given to the children of Israel not to work on the Sabbath. And one mention is enough to establish the principle, and God expects honest-hearted Bible students who want to please Him to be able to reason with it on every other matter. Together they show things authorized by God in His Word can be done on the Sabbath. I say again, the primary teaching in Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15 is that you don't get up and go to work on if you're a Jew and the law is binding on Saturday like you do on Sunday or Monday. You don't do that. Even Jesus said if your ox falls in the ditch on the Sabbath, you'll get him out. What was he trying to say? That's not your regular work. You don't go around all day long as the a uh, company that frees oxes from ditches. I read of someone, or I read of someone who wrote claiming there cannot be any divorce at all. And notice how they reason. I, you know, you think sometimes you've come across about everything and that's about the time you realize you haven't. Because Mark, Luke, and Paul only mention forbidding divorce. It is only Matthew then that mentions an exception, Matthew 19, 9. And that's three against one, so Matthew must not be talking to Christians. Majority one. <laughs> that's his reasoning. Now, I don't know when I'm studying with somebody. I may have to think for a while, discuss for a while, how do you get that kind of thinking out of a person's mind that that's the way he determines what the Bible teaches. I did run across a fellow I've mentioned to you all at times who, in my first local work, a young lady was attending and she wanted me to study with her daddy. So I went over one night and there he was, old enough to be my daddy, and I guess he had to do something to show how much he knew. He immediately declared that he didn't accept anything out of the Bible but the red letters that Jesus said. So I ask him, how do you know that Jesus said what the Bible says is his words? I said, all you have is what Matthew said Jesus said, and Mark said Jesus said, and Luke said Jesus said, and John said Jesus said. You don't have anything Jesus wrote down himself in the Bible. And he just looked at me. And the Bible study was over. He didn't get angry. He wasn't upset. He just had better things to do all of a sudden. But do you see how people can come up with something and that satisfies them so they stop right there? That's, that's satisfied. And then when it, the props get knocked out under it, they don't know what else to do. So they don't. Matthew 5, 31 through 32 focuses on what happens to one divorce. It focuses on what happens to the one divorced. Divorcing your wife makes her become an adulteress. Exception. If the divorce was due to fornication, the divorce does not make her become an adulteress. How could it? Why? <laughs> She's already been an adulteress. Marrying a divorced woman is adulterous. 
In Matthew 19, 9, you have this focus on what happens to the one doing the divorcing. See, if we don't recognize those focuses and the emphasis being given, I don't tell you what will happen. Divorcing your wife and marrying someone else makes you an adulterer. Exception? If the divorce was due to fornication, marrying someone else does not make you an adulterer, as long as that person, of course, is qualified to be to contract a marriage in the first place. Now, why? Well, Jesus is allowing the exception when the woman violated the marriage covenant. He's protecting the innocent party. That's the force of Matthew 19. He's protecting the innocent party. That's the focus. Miss that focus? I don't know where you're going after that. Some texts include the same second point as found in Matthew 5.32, marrying a divorced woman is adultery. Now, Mark 10, verses 11 and 12, shows that it does not matter who initiates the divorce. Divorcing your wife and marrying another, you commit adultery. Divorcing your husband and marrying another, you commit adultery. That is the Lord's general rule. He who makes the rule is the one who can make the exception, which he does in Matthew 19 to protect the innocent person. And that's the focus. Luke 16, 18 shows it does not matter if you are the one divorced or your spouse was the one divorced. It's still adultery. It's contrary to God's will. Divorcing your wife and marrying another, adultery is committed. Marrying a woman who is divorced, then one's committing adultery. Now come over to the epistles where Paul's addressing the church at Rome in Romans chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. What's the focus there? What is the emphasis? He's emphasizing that marriage is for the life of the two partners. You know, if both people entering into a scriptural marriage had that attitude and were going to work toward that like God said, all these other things wouldn't have to be dealt with. Like the old man in my first local work said, I told my wife, she was never going to leave me because wherever she's going, I was. There's a lot of truth to that. If you want a thing to work, both of you do, you can make it work. Marriage lasts until the death of the spouse. That's the point. Being married to someone else while the original husband lives is adultery. That ties in with Mark 10 and the general rule. Being married to someone else after the original husband is dead... It's not adultery. That's what Paul said. When you go over to 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11, there's another focus. He's focusing on avoiding divorce. Here's an unbeliever, not a Christian, and a believer. And he's talking about that situation. Context means something. Neither a man nor a woman should divorce their spouse. If a woman does divorce her spouse, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. While Matthew 19, 9, Mark chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, and Luke chapter 16, verse 18, are parallel accounts of the same event. Notice this. Notice that every discussion has a different focus, a different emphasis, a different point to make. That is a different point that's being brought out. No one passage is the complete discussion of divorce or remarriage. We've already established that, haven't we? But we have to know the context and the emphasis that's going on there when we study all these passages dealing with marriage, divorce, remarriage. Why is Mark the only one to mention that the wife can initiate a divorce? It's certainly not ruled out by the other passages. But consider that if you had to list every possible whatever, the complexity of the statements that you'd get, you'd have a catalog that would be unending. But God gives you the principles focusing on a certain thing and says if you hunger and thirst after righteousness and if you're going to write and divide the word of truth because you know therein is the way of salvation, then you will honestly, Luke 8, 15, take these things and reason through the situation to come to the right conclusion. You will never be able to be what God wants you to be 
If you can't abide by 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. The gospel is reasonable and it takes reasonable people to apply it, whether it's when one becomes a Christian or anything to do with worship or in daily living. Why does only Romans mention that marriage ends at the death of one spouse? Because the one mention of it is enough to cover all other passages that mention marriage. Don't need anything else. Why does only Matthew mention the exception? Because it establishes that the exception exists and covers all of the passages that mention divorce. It doesn't run them headlong into one another. They all fit together. So we must be careful not to insert our personal assumptions into the text. And that's a good place to start. Stop. Really, I guess it's a place to start in the rest of your Bible study. So these are some examples of how to go just on what the Word says. If you're not a child of God this morning, there's only one way to become a child of God. That's through belief in Jesus Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him as the Son of God, and being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. There is no other way. More than that you need not do to become a Christian. Less than that you cannot do and become one. As a Christian, if you've walked away from what the Word says, or you've read into it something that suits you, or however it is you violated God's will having become a Christian, then you need to repent of that, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Remember, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The Word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day, John 12, 48. If you're subject then to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand the same.